Good afternoon. It's Friday the 3rd of June 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me today, Patrick Henningsen. Welcome to the show. Great to be with you again, Mike. Uh, right. We're just going to get straight into it, I think. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Syria and, of course, the uh, Foreign Office, uh, UK, UK against Daesh or Daesh or Dosh or whatever it is, um, is uh, a Foreign Office Twitter account. And they're claiming that the Assad regime has de detained one, uh, hundreds of civilians fleeing Daesh uh, in Deir Zor. And they uh, cite this article here from a news organization called Now. Uh, this is a, a Lebanese news organization, Patrick. And uh, what this is saying is that uh, the Justice for Life Observatory is claiming that hundreds of people are being picked up by the uh, Assad regime uh, and put in uh, a detention camp, or, or rather they're saying that the facility is akin to a detention camp, so I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, but this is another NGO operating in Syria, one that I hadn't come across before. Uh, they claim to be a, an online source for news, and uh, uh, so at least now is the online uh, source for news. Uh, they're citing this NGO, um, and they have, uh, now has uh, people such as Michael Weiss, uh, ex-Henry Jackson Society writing for them as a contributor. Uh, he's former director of communications for that organization, in fact. Um, so um, It's a pro-Israeli uh, think tank, uh, uh, UK-based. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so so, so um, two issues here, Pat, really. First is, uh, once again, without challenge, quoting an NGO within Syria. Uh, and secondly, um, what, what is the, the state of play in Lebanon with regard to these uh, media outlets such as this? Well, uh, Lebanon's pretty open in, in terms of uh, setting up NGOs. There's, there's more NGOs per capita in Lebanon uh, maybe than any other country in the world. This is the NGO hub of the, Mid of the Middle East and right. in the MENA region. So this is here another partisan uh, media outlet. And you just did, we did a little digging. We could see who was behind this uh, media outlet. And you look at their stories and their editorial line on, on something like Syria. And it happens to be completely synchronized uh, with uh, the United States, uh, mm. the Foreign Office and, and, and the State Department in the U.S. So uh, again, uh, this is what we call the propaganda ring where government is connected uh, to either foundation-funded media outlets or NGO media outlets and NGOs on the ground uh, who are also being funded by those same governments. So all the information just swirls around that little sort of, uh, dare we call it a, well, we won't call it what we what swirls around, but uh, that's what happens. It, it is unfortunate that, uh, that as soon as you see um, the Foreign Office tweeting out uh, a news source, uh, it's almost we're almost at the point where that news source can be discredited straight away. And, and what they're doing with this particular story, uh, the Assad regime detaining people fleeing from uh, Deir Ezzor. So they did the same thing in, in saying the aid's not getting through. Aid's not getting through. So uh, we'll have a, a quote Well, indeed, here. this is this is a quote from Philip Hammond uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, this is talking about uh, uh, aid not getting through. So he's saying the Assad regime has cynically allowed limited amounts of aid into uh, Daraya, uh, but has failed to deliver the widespread, widespread humanitarian access called for by the international community. And of course, uh, what he's worried about about is uh, the humanitarian access which is being called for by the international community there to protect their team terrorists? Well, what he's saying is that we need to open up the supply lines uh, for uh, the terrorists inside this held area, I guess. So they open up the rat line. So they use the same technique with Medaya uh, before Christmas. They claim that there was a, the government was sieging the town of Medaya um, in the northwest of Damascus and that uh, they weren't allowing UN aid to get in and so forth. And therefore there was a famine and there had pictures, fake phony pictures were posted on Twitter by a number of organizations and media outlets claiming 
claiming uh, that there were starving, it was like a Holocaust type thing. So this is exactly the same sort of playbook here. So the aid, they're not letting the aid get through, but the reason the aid's not getting through is because this is a terrorist uh, held area and the government is at war with invading terrorists in the country. I don't know how sim more simple uh, the narrative get. can get. Mm -hmm. uh, if this happened in Britain, if we had terrorists basically holding a city uh, in anywhere in the UK, which has happened in the past, uh, what happens? The army comes in and it's a siege and uh, nothing can get in and out unless it's uh, through underground uh, channels. So no different in Syria. Mike. Right. So, um, of course, he's at the start of that quote, he says on the day of the deadline. And uh, so what deadline is that? Well, this is the International Security Support, uh, sorry, the International Syria Support Group. Um, which he says agreed last month that if humanitarian aid was still being denied to any area by the 1st of June, that the United Nations would launch a program of emergency deliveries by air. So uh, so that's what's going on there. Okay. Uh, and he's saying that uh, countries with influence over the Assad regime, such as Russia and Iran, must now ensure that air operations can proceed in a safe and secure manner. So they need to resupply uh, the tame terrorists and they want Russia and Iran's cooperation to make sure that that happens. So the rat lines have been cut off yeah. uh, by uh, Russian uh, airstrikes and Syrian army airstrikes and they want to reopen or create an airlift for terrorist forces here. So this is just uh, the, I don't know what to call it, um, it's kind of a, uh, vaudeville punch and judy act <laughs> pretending that these are uh, moderate rebels and that these terrorists aren't being supplied by western intelligence agencies yeah. uh, and they're sort of contractors it's unbelievable that the mainstream media is still falling for the gag mm. after so many years um so uh, but america does have an anti-isil plan yes that's that's true uh, america's got an anti-isil plan now i've Looked at this article, I found it quite interesting. This is a mainstream uh, Middle East correspondent here. Uh, his name is Michael Young. Uh, so he writes for the Daily Star and many other publications. So this is on the National. This is out of the United Arab Emirates. So he's a syndicated columnist, uh, Western syndicated columnist in the Middle East. So he's saying that uh, America's got an anti-ISIL plan, but it brings risks with it. And now the reason I picked this article, Mike, is because it typifies mainstream media coverage, which is basically designed to completely put you to sleep on all of these issues. So America's anti-ISIL plan they're talking about in Syria along the Kurdish region near Kobani, uh, working with the YPG to create the Syrian Democratic Forces, a brand new gang uh, designed by Langley in Virginia. Uh, so the, the quote from this article is interesting. So you know he starts off, and this is how you can dissect the very subtle lines of what I think is propaganda, but but this is a type of a gaslighting uh, fantasy. It's, it is single, in its single-minded pursuit of an anti-ISIL agenda in Syria and Iraq. Now this is fantasy because this is typical of a mainstream journalist who totally ignores that there is any clandestine uh, involvement or elements at play in ISIL or ISIS or Daesh or Daesh, what do you want to call it, or al-Nusra, that the Western uh, f forces are not behind there supplying them with weapons or running air cover for them or they're not being allowed free passage through NATO members like Turkey over the border and allowing their oil to be sold. So th that's the fantasy. The fact is, uh, and so he mixes it with fact. The fact is the United States risks creating a situation as bad, if not worse, than we have today. Washington uh, may precipitate a breakdown in state structures in both countries that leave Sunni communities. Uh, they're more vulnerable to extremist groups. That is actually probably closer to fact. Now, what he's admitting here is that the uh, strategy by the United States to create a new counter gang and a new gang uh, with the Syrian and Democratic forces, a new sort of Mujahideen uh, comprised of Kurds and others, uh, this is going to increase instability. This is going to make for more of a more fighting, more street fighting, more lawlessness uh, in both Syria and Iraq. Mm -hmm. So, but it's the mixture of fantasy and fact that mainstream journalists excel at, and this really uh, puts the public to sleep 
on all of these stories, and you just gr graze over it. And this is what mainstream media does mm. in print and, uh, and on television. Uh, well, here we've got uh, here we've got uh, Sputnik uh, quoting Harold Kajat, uh, Kujat, sorry, who is uh, the U.S. special envoy for the U.S.-led coalition that is allegedly fighting Islamic State in Syria and uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, Sorry, I apologize, I got that wrong. He is the former chief of staff of NATO, senior military uh, authority. So he's saying that uh, any NATO involvement in the Syrian military campaign, campaign uh, would bring more instability to the peace process. That seems reasonable. Uh, and uh, uh, Brett McGurk, who, was, who is a special uh, envoy, uh, was saying that uh, the use of NATO surveillance air aircraft to back the coalition uh, could be brought up uh, at the July summit in, in uh, uh, Warsaw. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Harold Kojat saying, uh, in this pretext, it's really about making NATO part of the Syrian operation, but he's saying that this is, uh, this is creating risks because negotiations are very unstable. Well, so those are the risks, negotiations are unstable, the Americans not helping, uh, well, uh, sorry, NATO not helping. Uh, and of course, in response to that, uh, America immediately sending another carrier group uh, over uh, to Syria uh, to fight ISIS, apparently. Yeah, well, the, the, the joke is on the public of anybody that believes any of these statements, because this is a perfect example, Mike, uh, the, the, the whole concept of NATO. Oh, well, NATO's not going to get involved in Syria. Wait a minute, NATO is involved in Syria. The United States is leading airstrikes in Syria. We have special forces on the ground wearing Kurdish uniforms, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Turkey, who is a NATO member, who's fa facilitating the free flow of terrorist forces for the last five years into Syria, into Iraq, okay? So NATO is involved in a big way. NATO, NATO countries, Britain is involved. Um, so France is involved. So NATO is there. NATO is running the operation to destabilize Syria and parts of Iraq. And it's not, it's not even up for debate. And the, the fact that NATO isn't officially in makes no difference in reality to the people on the ground in Syria. And this is, this is a perfect example of governments gaslighting the public and, and where people can't even tell the difference between uh, a, you know, a glazed donut and a glazed donut. Yeah. They're both the same. NATO is in Syria, is in Iraq. And for them to come on and deny and say, well, we're not ready to, for NATO to come in when they're already in is, is a perfect example of the PSYOP, which I, I think is running on the public 24 seven. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to Yemen uh, then because that, uh, conflict continues uh, with continually almost no coverage in the mainstream media at all. But this uh, perhaps on the face of it looks like uh, a positive development because the United Nations uh, has apparently placed the Saudi-led so-called military coalition, uh, which is well, we have to laugh at France 24's coverage at a certain, uh, to a certain degree because they insist on in calling it Yemen's government. So the Saudi-led coalition is supporting Yemen's government. Uh, but the UN has put uh, the Saudis on an, a blacklist over the deaths of hundreds of children. So there's at least an acknowledgement uh, that the Saudis uh, killing innocent bystanders rather than uh, fighting uh, any kind of uh, any kind of actual rebels uh, and uh, they're saying uh, the UN saying emergency um, sorry emerging and escalating crises had a horrific impact on boys and girls uh, they're saying the situation in Yemen was particularly worrisome uh, with a five-fold increase in the number of children recruited by armed groups uh, and six times more children killed and maimed compared to 2014. So that's a worrisome situation, Patrick. Is worrisome the word that you would use to describe it? No, it's, it's, a, it's a total disaster, Yemen. So where is the international outrage? Where are the UN sanctions? And what is this, a slap on the wrist? It's, 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 it's not even a slap on the wrist. It's not even a slap on the wrist. Because so. uh, the United Nations, they put them on a blacklist, black but they're not getting, the, getting rid of them from the human rights uh, 
Council. Uh, council. Yeah. So. And so, so the UN is happy to take Saudi money, and uh, you know, to fund the U UN Human Rights Council and put Saudi Arabia at the head of that organization. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia is dropping cluster bombs mm -hmm. on civilian targets. Meanwhile, they are bombing Yemen into the last century. No, forget the last century. Back to the Stone Age. And uh, this is a humanitarian disaster. Millions of people being displaced every month. And this is all the international. Community. Is this the same international community that Philip Hammond's talking about? Uh, it is. And uh, where is the outrage? Where is the righteous indignation? It doesn't exist for Yemen. Why is that? Is that does that have anything to do with the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia is the best customer for the UK and the US defense industry over the last 13, 14 months? Is that have anything to well, do with and, it? Well, and historically as well, let's not forget Al Yamama. But, you know, we've been selling arms to that country for, for decades. Uh, and uh, w and in a particularly corrupt manner as well. So but that's that's the UN, uh, you know, this NATO and this Security Council, basically. Yeah. It's uh, it's all about money at the end of the day. Yes. Now uh, we've been talking about uh, over the last number of weeks the response by Russia and China to the uh, provocations uh, that, uh, of course, we say that they are making, or at least our government says we don't say that um, but here is another uh, example of the response from Russia at least so Russia is going to be holding strategic missile forces uh, exercises over 50 of them over uh, 2016 uh, this is uh, uh, Nikolai Yevmenov reporting that the uh, two Borai class ballistic missile submarines in the northern fleet uh, and uh, um, various others are going to be in service and carrying out patrols uh, and uh, uh, with more vessels transferred to the Pacific Fleet later in the year. So Russia absolutely um, moving their uh, assets around the chessboard. Uh, and they're saying that the strategic missile forces are going to hold, as I say, 50 exercises in 2016, 30 of them being snap drills. So they're clearly ex wanting them to be absolutely uh, on the money and ready, ready for any, uh, any scenario that uh, crops up. Well, the, the, it, this is what Russia has been doing for the last 20 years, is uh, reconfiguring its uh, military assets for a rapid deployment, so a, a lighter, more rapid um, reaction force. This is the thing that uh, the U.S. And, and NATO talk about a lot in terms of how they'd like the future army to be. This is what Donald Rumsfeld's great dream was. But if you look at Russia, is actually the country that's actually done this. And you look at what they did in Syria. They came in uh, in, the, in the fall of 2015, and they were out uh, by the spring mm. of 2016. So this is a rapid reaction force that yep. moved in, did the job, and left. You, you know, it'd be nice if uh, maybe Washington would, would take Russia's lead on that and leave after the job's supposedly done or mission accomplished. But that is impossible, Pat, is it? Because what we actually are running is a perpetual war. So the, the aim here is to maintain low intensity, uh, perpetual warfare. Uh, and that means that the demand for arms sales never disappears. Uh, in the meantime, millions of people uh, die or are injured, starve. Uh, and have hellish lives. Uh, this is the national interest. Um, and uh, this is retired, uh, uh, retired army, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Daniel Davis. Uh, and uh, he's calling for an end to the uh, US policy of perpetual warfare. He's saying, since the tragic events of September 11th, the core tenet of US engagement with the rest of the world has been deploying military force against terrorists abroad and denying them territory from which to launch new attacks. Uh, he's saying Consider considerable data is now piling up that proves these non-stop military actions have not be, uh, squelched the terrorist threat, but have increased risk to the United States. Flatly stated, evidence confirms the employment of lethal military power that we have relied on for the past 15 years has failed to protect America. It's important that the creators and practitioners of U.S. foreign policy at the State Department and the White House do not merely cease these counterproductive actions, but discard the, the martial philosophy that spawns these actions and replace it with a superior product. So that's pretty clear. Well, that's uh, yeah, perpetual warfare, low intensity conflicts, but all the while feeding and nurturing the gangs and the counter gangs on the ground that are able to keep the instability going. That's 
I believe what we're seeing right now in Syria, that's what we saw in Afghanistan uh, for, for many decades. This is what we see in Yemen. Uh, this is what we, with AQAP, yeah. who is effectively Saudi Arabia's ground force in Yemen. Yeah. This is what we're seeing throughout Africa. This is what we see in all of these conflict zones. So this is absolutely a policy of, uh, of, of permanent instability, permanent destabilization, uh, where order can be imposed out of chaos. And if it's not um, a, a so-called civil war that's being created, it's a color revolution. And here we've got another one. Now, we mentioned this uh, some time ago, and this article here is uh, from the beginning of May. Uh, how paint became a weapon in Macedonia's colorful revolution. So we've moved on from color revolutions to colorful revolutions. And of course, this is absolutely Soros linked organizations at work once again. Now, the BBC finally caught up with this today uh, and they published a, uh, a video on their uh, video report on the website. Uh, and the, here's a couple of stills from it. So we can see the activities of the protesters. Uh, and uh, just to put this in a bit of context, uh, this is where Macedonia sits in the Balkans. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight uh, this article from Global Research, uh, Color Revolution in Macedonia Towards a New Balkans War. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the uh, Andrew um, Korimko, yes, Andrew Korimko, uh, speaking to the Macedonian National Press Agency. Uh, and they asked him, uh, they said to him, according to some information in both the Macedonian and Serbian media, the Russian intelligence services are warning uh, about the West's uh, intention to provoke a Balkan war with a spiral of violence unfolding in various places, including Skopje and Belgrade. Uh, the, the, their idea is to show that the governments of Macedonia uh, and Serbia are weak uh, and that they need foreign help or intervention or whatever it is they're calling uh, their deviant attempts to manipulate and control other countries and nations. Can you share some more information regarding this issue with our readers? And he says, uh, I suggested that uh, Serbia and the Republic of Macedonia are each destined to share the same strategic fate in coming years. This is because none of these states are in the EU or NATO, and, are also, and also because two of them, Serbia and Macedonia, plan to host Russia and China's multipolar transnational connective infrastructure projects, a gas pipeline, and high-speed railroad, respectively. The US is pursuing a dual-track policy uh, towards the Central Balkans, simultaneously trying to gain controlling influence over the three targeted states while also working to totally destabilize them. Uh, Washington uh, would like to be able to seize control of these governments so they can exert indirect proxy influence over Russia's proposed Balkan Stream gas pipeline and China's Balkan Silk Road high-speed railway or cancel them outright. If not, uh, but if not, uh, sorry, but if it's not successful in doing so, then it would have no qualms about throwing these countries into chaos in order to offset these projects. So once again, we see what is behind uh, the color revolutions that are going on there. This is regime change. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the kind of upping the ante on uh, the, uh, the the velvet revolutions uh, that we saw in the last decade. Uh, and this, these are a little bit more vociferous. And then you have the BBC cheering uh, as people throw paint on all the national monuments and deface all the country's uh, heritage. Yeah. Uh, the BBC's there to cheer them along, and uh, away we go. Uh, and that's that is what it's about. It's not just it's not just putting some paint on the road or something, they, they are attacking the national heritage of the country. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's about national pride and national uh, uh, sort of nationality and, and national borders. Yeah, they want to break that down and then uh, that will be replaced with um, uh, the, the, to get the millennials in that country to clamor for uh, membership to the EU. And how they'll do this as well as they'll promise them uh, fast track membership in the press like they did with the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and you have all the college students showing up in Maidan Square saying, yes, we want in a future with the EU, but they don't get that future with the EU. What they get is a uh, destroyed central government, chaos, anarchy, more corruption, and IMF loans on top of that. That's what you get. Right. So, so we're getting this in the Middle East. We're getting it in the Balkans. Uh, are we going to get it in Europe? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But just before we get there, um, Europe allegedly backing away from TTIP? Yes, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, allegedly backing away, uh, allegedly being the operative word, Mike. So this is an interesting development now. 
the timing of this with the Brexit uh, movement in the UK is no coincidence, actually. But what we have, there was a kind of a quid pro quo, Mike, whereby early on in the TTIP planning, uh, the EU was promised access to US government contracting uh, bids, which is hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Okay, and then in return, US uh, big agricultural companies will get access to European markets mm -hmm. for fertilizer. We're talking about Monsanto. We're talking about Cargill. Uh, we're also talking about food producers, cheap US agricultural products to be placed in in supermarkets around Europe. So that was the, the trade-off. Then suddenly the US government changed tax on this and weren't going to open up uh, uh, no uh, government contract bidding to your EU firms. And all of a sudden now there's no uh, reciprocation mm -hmm. with TTIP. So this has uh, created a little bit of a problem uh, in Brussels uh, and in Washington. But um, th the whole point of this, Mike, is now you can see what TTIP is. It's to reduce uh, regulations. It's to uh, lower corporate taxes, lower standards, okay, and raise profits for transnational only corporations mm. where they will flood the markets with their products and kill, destroy any small to medium sized businesses. And in the farming sector, you can be absolutely certain this is what will happen. You think small farms and local farms are devastated now? Wait, wait. till wait till mm. TTIP passes. That will be the knockout punch for, for growing local. What you'll be left with is some boutique products at a local farmer's market that'll be have to be subsidized by the government just to survive. Yeah. And, and that's what you'll be left with, just tourist kind of souvenir food, but no real production for and by local people consumed for local communities. That will be finished. Right. Now, um, one of the key points of, that I've been trying to make over the last number of months is that uh, the EU referendum actually has got this is irrelevant to this discussion. Um, this is the document that David Cameron produced after he had finished his grand tour of uh, Europe, the best of both worlds, the United Kingdom's special status in a reformed European Union. This is what the EU referendum is about. It's about this document, not about anything else. It's not an in-out referendum. It's actually about this document. Uh, and it, the document makes it absolutely clear with regard to TTIP, concluding the trade deals already underway could ultimately be worth blah, 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 blah. These include the UK's top trade priority. This is the UK's top trade priority. Nothing to do with whether we're in the EU or out of the EU. This is our top trade priority, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which alone, and they give some more figures which are nonsense uh, and, and are just sheer propaganda, but it doesn't matter that single line. Uh, indicates where the where Britain's policy is with regard to these trade deals and this will go through whether we're in or out of or whether the result of the EU referendum is in or out yeah this is a, you're, this is what it's all about yeah this is what it's all about so um, and, and what and what people need to be reminded of um, the the brexit issue is uh, a red herring. It's uh, a false flag. A psyop. It's a psyop. It's about TTIP. It has always been about TTIP. The timing of the uh, Tories' uh, Brexit epiphany uh, should be suspect to so many people, um, as it's coming at the same time that TTIP is teetering on the edge of being implemented this year yeah. or next year. Yeah. Okay. Now it could run into problems, Mike. It could be TTIP could be pushed down the road a little bit, but but the infrastructure for TTIP is already in place. The policies are already in place. All they need to do is flick the switch on, and it's uh, it's going to happen. So that is going to give it, that that is the official corporate takeover. This is what the Trilateral Commission and Bilderberg and all these groups have been working on for decades, yeah. is this moment right now, right now. which is the, the usurping of national sovereignty by a new corporate transnational structure. That is what TTIP is. That is what the Trans-Pacific Partnership is. It's about nothing else. Yeah. It's about removing your sovereignty, your due process, your rule of law, and to a superseded sort of corporate transnational global entity. Absolutely. So, uh, and, but in the meantime, we have the clown show. Uh, and, uh, you know, a Thames flotilla, Brexit, what, what, 
what is this, what is this about? Is we've it, got serious issues that need discussed, and we've got people floating up the Thames in a flotilla. This is like the Queen coming up the Thames in her flotilla on the uh, anniversary of, uh, was it uh, Dunkirk? Yeah. The little ships? Yeah. And uh, this is Nigel Farage coming up the Thames, waving like the Queen, apparently, <laughs> and for ch chanting for an EU referendum. And it, all I can say here is, yeah, I know there's a lot of Nigel Farage fans out there, um, Mike, but he is playing completely into the uh, establishment's narrative on Brexit. And where is, how come Nigel Farage should be shouting louder? All these people should be shouting from the rafters about TTIP, not about Brexit. Because Brexit, it, it, like you said, it doesn't matter whether the vote's in or out. Yeah. The, the real issue of sovereignty, I believe, is not with Brussels right now as much as it is with this trade agreement. Absolutely. This will transform life. And the unemployment figures are starting to come out now. I've read uh, at minimum one million job loss. Mm. You know, and we, under 25s in this country and all around Europe, the unemployment rate is, is skyrocketing. In some European countries, it's 50%. So can we afford to add another couple of million to the to the dole queues? Can we? No. This is what TTIP is going to bring. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, uh, we can't uh, have a day on the or a discussion on the EU referen referendum without a, an intervention by a Miliband, and here we've got David. Uh, and uh, our financial services will be at risk, apparently, if we uh, leave the EU. Mm. This is just typical of the absolute crass, low standard of the discussion on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, so Britain has the fastest growing financial services sector in the world, but a vote to leave the European Union would put that at risk, he said. Uh, investment is encouraged, enhanced and emboldened by the UK's membership of the EU. Well, I'm not going to give this any more time because he's, he's talking nonsense. And let's just remind ourselves of what we discussed uh, earlier in the week. Uh, the UK, the most corrupt country in the world, uh, this absolutely, this discussion um, was about the city of London and the financial services sector in this country, the biggest money laundering exercise on the planet uh, based in this country. So I'm sorry, Mr. Miliband, but if that's your best, uh, your best example of why we should uh, stay in the European Union, I think you can take it and uh, go head off back to Hillary. Well, if, Where I understand he's going to get a job if she becomes president. Quite possibly. But, you know, <laughs> read the fine print on the trans, uh, uh, Atlantic uh, Trade and Partnership. Yeah. Read the fine print on TTIP. Reducing FSA regulations. Yes. Uh, allowing American companies to enter the financial services market here. Allowing uh, UK companies or City of London companies to get a better foothold in New York. It's, this is about the global takeover of, of the Ponzi economy. Yeah. Uh, and you think it's bad now, it's going to get even worse. They'll be leveraging up, I don't know, 100 to 1 in New York and maybe 200 to 1 in City of London. You know, great if interest, minus interest loans, mm. you know, between banks. Mm. This is great if we could have access to this sort of uh, financial regulations. But no, we, we don't have access. Only a select number of people, uh, special firms, special individuals have access to capital. Well, well, let's let's bring it full circle because we were talking about the chaos in Syria and the Middle East. We were talking about the potential chaos uh, with a new color revolution in Macedonia. Um, this, I think, brings us to the point because the only rational conversation seems to be coming out of Russia these days. Lavrov saying that uh, Europe is turning into a region that radiates instability. This is extremely dangerous. We're seeing uh, the. Uh, situation in France with the labor strikes there. Uh, we're seeing this whole argument over TTIP. This is being done deliberately, I believe, to get TTIP through. Um, it's to destabilize nations. We've got the, the refugee crisis causing the destabilization of nations and national borders. Uh, and Lavrov uh, saying, uh, Europe is being turned into a region that radiates not well-being but instability where witnesses to major changes in the international scene. Uh, Russia is part of the global world and it's changing right before our eyes. Uh, he said that uh, new centers of growth and influence were emerging uh, and gaining strength, including in the Asia-Pacific region, but he was particularly concerned about, uh, about what was going on in Europe. So uh, these warnings aren't given uh, lightly.
You know, and, and you know, the immigration issue in, in Europe, uh, you know, in terms of these corporations that will benefit from TTIP, they're looking at this problem as a boon for cheap labor. That's all it is. Yeah. It's a boon for cheap labor and for part-time labor and non-contract labor. And this is what these firms want, to get some kind of a competitive advantage. But also, uh, they'll continue flooding poor countries' markets with their products. French, Former French colonies will get French products. Former British colonies will get British products. And it's just about opening up markets. And they will decide, the cartel of companies will decide who gets what. Because yeah. that's what cartels do. They carve up markets and they say, well, okay, you, you, you're mafia and you you sell this, I'm the mafia, I sell that, you get that part, I get that part. And they all agree together and they agree to knock out all the competition. Yeah. Any small local businesses, local firms, they're out. The map is divided up, the protection racket runs. That's how it goes yeah. and that's what it's about. Yes, okay, let's uh, move on to a new subject. Um, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but uh, here's a bit more. Yeah, so this is interesting, this is uh, New York Daily News. So. We were talking about the film Spotlight uh, yesterday on a program with uh, Brian Garish. So the Catholic Church spent $2 million on a major a New York lobbying firm uh, to block uh, child sex law reform. Now, this just came out um, last week, actually, but it's kind of made its rounds uh, through the media. And this kind of echoes what the point that Brian and I were making uh, yesterday, and that, you know, this is funny that this would come out, this should be... Spotlight got so much publicity mm. as a movie, okay, which is a reflection of a scandal which happened before. Mm. And this story should send shockwaves through the mainstream media, and yet it didn't. Mm. It is in a couple of mainstream outlets, but didn't get any of the coverage, not half of the attention that this film got, mm. because it was up for a couple of Oscars. Because we've got to present the idea it was all historic. Yes, yeah, but the reality is this. Yeah. Uh, the, they're, they're spending too many on law. What's, what's even worse about this, Mike, is that there's lobbying firms ready to take up this sort of work. And I talked about the lobbyists yesterday. Mm. They're running Washington, D.C., and they are probably, in terms of prostitution, corporate prostitution, there, there is no limits for lobbying firms. To take up a, a job like this is pretty shocking. Yes. Um, now, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was quite some time ago. You suggested that just wait. It's only a matter of time before... Trump supporters start burning buildings down? No, it's uh, Sanders supporters. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, well, what's going on with Donald then? Well, those, this is kind of very close to what I was saying, but uh, so a Trump rally in California is like the epicenter uh, for anti-Trump um, activism. So D Donald Trump, they're trying to make it so he can't have any political events in California. And so this was in San Jose. I used to live uh, a few miles away from this uh, from, for years. I went to school there as well. So uh, they show up at a Donald Trump rally. These, this anti-Trump, and this gets violent, actually. So I see that the bottom, the bottom there, it says protesters punch through eggs at Trump supporters. So, so we've got, uh, we've got agent provocateur out. Uh, are these, are these uh, Hillary supporters, perhaps, uh, uh, out uh, to cause a bit of trouble? I don't know if they're Hillary or maybe more likely uh, happen to be Sanders supporters, but all organized through the Democratic Party machine via websites like moveon.org, which is a George Soros funded So we're uh, back to another Soros NGO. So, the, so what you see in, in color revolutions in Arab Spring and in Ukraine, what you see overseas, and I always say, I say people, if you don't pay attention to what happens overseas, you will get it in, in heavy doses at home. Yeah. And this is exactly what they're doing in America. Now, whether you agree with Donald Trump or not is beside the point. What you have here is you have uh, NGOs funded by Wall Street billionaires trying to affect the outcome of elections mm -hmm. by denying, whether you agree with this candidate's comments or not, but denying him or his voters uh, participation in the democratic process, mm -hmm. which is what happened in Georgia, which is what's happened in the Ukraine, which is what's happened in, in Armenia, and where is this, Macedonia? Macedonia yeah. So there's a color revolution 2.0 at a neighborhood near you is what it is. So the U.S. is an embryonic color revolution going on right in front of our eyes. Right in front. You know what? This isn't the first. Mm. Get used to this because this will be the norm yeah. for the next few years. Yeah. Okay, completely change the subject again. You wanted to highlight this. I thought this was completely uh, outrageous of a story, but it's true. Uh, so the headline is, Tube Boss is disgusting for celebrating ticket office 
closures, and that's according to the RMT. So this is a black tie affair at a posh uh, London venue where I don't know how many uh, 50 senior TFL managers attended a black tie Mayfair dinner to mark, to, to, to celebrate hundred, the closure of hundreds of uh, London underground ticket offices. Yeah. Now, is there something wrong with this picture? <laughs> is this something you should be celebrating? Uh, I don't know. The, 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 the raisin tube prayers, and I'm going to say this, Mike, they talk about, oh, the need for, for maintenance. Oh, the need for new trains. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so London has the most expensive public transport now in the world, mm -hmm. number one. Okay, the infrastructure is already built. It's paid for. There are, there are no big outlays. It's just a little bit of topping up maintenance that needs to go on. And they still need to uh, have it as a personless service now. They want it run by robots and computers, basically. Yep. So, t so th because they want to track your journeys. Not only that, but they they want to maximize their profits. And this is what happens when you sell off public assets to private companies, is they start asset stripping. They start asset stripping. Who built London Underground, Mike? The British people built London Absolutely. Underground. British taxpayers built it with their sweat equity and paying for it over the years and the West Indians who helped build and run that who came from Jamaica and Trinidad okay that's who built London Underground the people of Britain and then the gov the, the recent government is allowed to sell it off for nothing to to a select number of shareholders by inv invitation only and then they get to asset strip that thing which has been built up, that service. It's not just the infrastructure, Mike. It's the service. No, well, this is this is the model that has been applied to every utility, water supply, electricity supply. Thatcher started this. this gas. Is gas. This is the model that's been used. Uh, they sell the, the, the infrastructure notionally to these companies who asset strip it. Uh, who's left with the maintenance bill? The taxpayer. Who's left with the uh, with the future development of that infrastructure? The taxpayer, but the profits have gone. And that's why it costs uh, 120 pounds to get a train from Paddington to Bristol. Yeah. And it costs less than that to fly to Copenhagen. Yeah. That's what you get. That's what you get. Well, look, we're going to leave today on what is perhaps a piece of good news. Two Deutsche Bank traders indicted in the United States over LIBOR manipulation. Uh, so uh, this was yesterday. They, uh, the department uh, said that uh, between 2005 and 2011, Matthew Connolly of New Jersey and Gavin Campbell of London, Gav sorry, Gavin Campbell Black of London, uh, worked with at least eight others to fix the LIBOR, which was the uh, interbank lending rate, if you remember. Uh, and uh, they've now been charged with this and uh, are hopefully going to prison. Uh, and the, there is a continuing investigation in London as well. 20 people so far charged in that. It's a shame that it's taking so long uh, to, to get to this point. Uh, but of course, the key point here is that uh, these uh, guys, um, they, they were at the bottom of the pyramid when it comes to this manipulation. So Traitors? So, yes. Traitors who get arrested for LIBOR. Right. So, so when, are, when are we going to see some bank management arrested for this? Well, better, better two rogue traders than Martin Aegis or somebody yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, so no, no executives, none of the people who are actually doing the fixing, uh, rate fixing on LIBOR. They walk scot-free. You probably see a few of them at Bilderberg uh, this year. Quite possibly. Uh, so <laughs> rogue traders. Yeah. Floor traders. Yeah. You know, yeah, they were responsible. They did it. Let's arrest them, put them in a country club for a year and a half, and their bonuses are still in a, in a, in a pot a, somewhere. secure account somewhere. We need to do something about these banks yeah. once and for all. Okay, well, look, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for taking part today, Patrick. Uh, we'll be back at, on Monday at 1 o'clock as usual. Have a good weekend, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye.